welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello and welcome. I'm Zenobia Morrill, a doctoral student and a news reporter for Madden America. In this week's podcast, I'm thrilled to announce Dr. Lucy Johnston as our guest. We will be discussing her involvement in the groundbreaking power threat meaning framework, as well as her reflections on its response during this past year after it was launched. To hear more about the Power Threat Meaning Framework, be sure and listen to the podcast she completed with us last year at Madden America, in addition to other links included below. Dr. Lucy Johnston is a consultant clinical psychologist, author of Users and Abusers of Psychiatry, and co-editor of Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy, Making Sense of People's Problems, and A Straight-Talking Guide to Psychiatric Diagnosis along with a number of other chapters and articles taking a critical perspective on mental health theory and practice. She is the former program director of the Bristol Clinical Psychology Doctorate and was the lead author of Good Practice Guidelines on the Use of Psychological Formulation. She has worked in adult mental health settings for many years, most recently in a service in South Wales. She was lead author, along with Professor Mary Boyle, for the Power Threat Meaning Framework a division of clinical psychology funded project to outline a conceptual alternative to psychiatric diagnosis, which was published in January of 2018. Lucy is also an experienced conference speaker and lecturer and currently works as an independent trainer. Her particular interest and expertise is in the use of psychological formulation in both its individual and team versions and in promoting trauma-informed practice. Good to have you back for another interview, Lucy. Welcome. Thank you. It's very nice to be here again. Yeah, it's really our pleasure to have you here again, especially as we reflect on the responses to the Power Threat Meaning Framework over this past year. To begin with some background, you've discussed the Power Threat Meaning Framework as a conceptual alternative. Why did you believe we need an alternative diagnostic framework? In other words, what's the problem with the DSM? Okay, that's a good place to start. And uh, maybe the first thing to say is that we don't think we need a new diagnostic framework. We think we need a new framework which is Mm non-diagnostic so that's what we've attempted to provide but you and anyone who visits Madden America will be well aware as many other people are that the current diagnostic framework is facing a lot of problems of course experiences of distress are very real people really do feel suicidal and desperate and anxious and hopeless and hear hostile voices and have mood swings and so on but it's never been demonstrated that these very real experiences are best understood as medical illnesses that need diagnosing and on there is also a great deal of evidence that people are ultimately responding to events in their lives when they go through these very difficult experiences so we have a kind of false analogy we are treating emotional suffering which is my preferred term really, as though it was the same and could be understood in the same way as things that go wrong in our bodies, for which it may be perfectly sensible and helpful to try and come up with a diagnosis. So the diagnostic system that doesn't work, and interestingly, as you may well know, and as listeners may well know, even the people who put the diagnostic manuals together, people like Dr Alan Francis, are publicly admitting that. Indeed, he's used the word bullshit to describe the idea that you can define a mental disorder which is interesting and in fact the diagnostic models are being rewritten from scratch so we actually clearly need something different now of course people have varying ideas about what that different should look like whether it should be in some sense a better more effective diagnostic framework or whether it should be something completely different but it's obvious I think to everybody on every side of the debate that the current diagnostic system is not working. We do need these something different. And it's our view that the big difference needs to be a fundamental shift away from the assumption that these difficulties and these forms of distress are best understood as medical illnesses. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And the shift away from diagnosis, actually. Some people say that the DSM or ICD are helpful and that they group together people with like symptoms for research purposes, provide a common language for practitioners, or even helpful for reimbursement purposes and categorizing different treatments for people with similar symptoms. Um, how would you respond to that? Well, 
legitimate diagnosis, medical diagnosis does do those things. That's why we have it. So we can group symptoms together and suggest what's the best treatments or interventions. I mean, I would actually challenge that language, first of all, the language of symptoms and illnesses and treatments, because it all implies the same unproven model. And actually, I think it'd be very hard to maintain that psychiatric diagnosis performs any of the function that diagnosis does in what I would call legitimate branches of medicine. So we do need ways of grouping different kind of experiences together so that we can think about the best way forward and all the rest of it. But the diagnostic system doesn't do that. We, I guess, are claiming that we've come up with something that does that better. Mm -hmm. Equally, it's true that in the current system, diagnosis is needed for some practical purposes like access to welfare and benefits and for the foreseeable future probably will be. But equally, we want to claim that we found that there are more effective ways of doing that that don't require you to subscribe to a label, which is actually not valid and is seen by and experienced by many people as very damaging. Mm -hmm. And so subscriptions in this way to these labels that aren't valid and align with more medical analogies that don't fit for emotional suffering, Mm -hmm. do you feel that this discourse has through the DSM has helped form societal and professional thinking about psychiatric difficulties in a way that has been harmful. The DSM and its European equivalent, the ICD, has certainly had a profound effect on forming society and professional thinking. And it's chicken and egg, isn't it? It's also arisen out of a certain way of thinking about things. It's had a profound effect. And I would certainly argue, as would many other people, that the overall effect has been very damaging. So I think it's almost impossible to overestimate its influence, in fact, and uh, or to sort of grasp how deeply it's infiltrated, I mean, all sorts of areas of our lives, not just services, but, you know, the legal system, the welfare system, as we said, and to the extent that people are actually coming along and diagnosing themselves, this language is everywhere, you know, it's in campaigns like anti-stigma campaigns it's on google it's in the media it's in people's training programs it's become something that mary boyle in her useful phrase calls the dsm mindset it's not just a particular set of assumptions or labels it's a whole way of thinking that's deeply embedded even within the minds of people who don't particularly know anything about mental health or haven't come across the ideas or the critiques before so it's profoundly shapes how we see distress. And of course, it seems to be growing in influence. So a, a larger area of what we might once have called ordinary human experience is being subsumed under this particular model. Mm-hmm. And there's an awful lot of evidence, and you will know this, of course, but people like Robert Whittaker have shown, I think, quite conclusively that this kind of approach coupled with the psychiatric drugs that it invites, you know, does not over the long term on average help people or make them better. In fact, levels of disability across countries rise in tandem usually with the influx of psychiatric drugs. You know, people on the whole come into psychiatric services, on the whole, this turns into the first step in what can easily become a long-term psychiatric career. And that's not to say that nobody ever gets help. It's not to say that professionals are real motivated. It's not to say that it's all bad. Of course it isn't. But the fundamental model clearly isn't working and we clearly need something different. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really powerful to think about the way that this has infiltrated, not just these movements and anti-stigma campaigns, but just internalizing how people understand themselves or how understand other people. And you're noting that this system has done harm, it lacks validity and it's not working and that the power threat meaning framework offers something else. So would you mind speaking a bit now to the core aims of the power threat meaning framework? Yes, I will indeed. So the power threat meaning framework is a ridiculously, ludicrously ambitious attempt and an ongoing attempt, not a complete answer, but we hope a start to outline a conceptual alternative to the diagnostic model of distress. So, of course, we already have a number of different ways of approaching distress, which aren't diagnostically based. And um, we've drawn from a lot of those. An awful lot of what's in the framework isn't new, in fact, but we hope we've pulled it together in a way that is a bit new. 
and in the form of a, we've chosen the word framework deliberately, it's kind of an umbrella, if you like, that supports and you know, we hope centres and makes more, gives more evidence and credibility and support for the many non-diagnostic ways of working that already exist, as well as suggesting new ways forward. But we're intending it as um, a, a major step away from not just particular use of language and particular labels, but a whole way of thinking that we've just described, getting away from the whole DSM mindset. And that's partly why it had to be so long and dense and detailed, really, because we didn't really want just to tweak the, addition, the existing system. We didn't just want to say, well, here's an extra way of doing things that might be helpful. We wanted to go beyond that, which required us to really dig quite deeply into the philosophical and conceptual principles of the DSM approach and do a massive overview of all the relevant research. So that's our aim. And the aim, I guess, is to move in simple terms away from the what is wrong with you towards the what is what has happened to your question. Mm. So to put it as its briefest, I guess we are, we are evidencing, we hope the idea that people's distress is understandable in context, mm. but we wanted to think about context in its broadest form. So we, one of the things we wanted to do was to really make very clear the link between personal distress and social contexts, mm. social inequality, social injustices. In other words, to put power really on the map. And power is not only missing from psychiatric thinking, it's missing from a lot of psychological thinking, it's missing from a lot of psychotherapeutic thinking. And along with that, we wanted to have a framework that supports people to help tell their stories, you know, narratives of all sorts. So the simplest answer to what you do instead of diagnosis is you listen to people's stories. So this is a framework we hope that both validates the idea that narratives are an alternative to diagnosis and supports the construction or co-construction of particular narratives and looks at patterns in those narratives. Mm. And finally, we wanted, I mean, I could say a lot more, but the third important thing to say is that the framework applies to all of us. So we really wanted to get away from this whole idea that there's a group of people who are somehow mentally ill and therefore different in some fundamental way we're all subject to the negative influence of power. We all suffer distress at times. The framework is actually about all of us. Thank you for summarizing that. I know it's really a rich framework and it can be difficult to bring it into those three pieces, but I think you did so quite well. Um, when you say putting power on the map, what is it about power that felt important to highlight there? What do you mean? And the framework hinges on four core questions. And the first one, which could be read as what has happened to you, we have rephrased as how is power operating in your life? Mm -hmm. Just for the sake of completeness, I'll read the other three questions. The second question is how did it affect you? In other words, what kind of threats does this pose? The third question is what sense did you make of it? Or what is the meaning of those situations and experiences? And the fourth question is, what did you have to do to survive? In other words, what kinds of threat responses are you using? So by starting with power, we're starting with the context of people's lives, mm -hmm. the context in the broadest possible sense. So we roughly sketched out some of the major forms of power that need considering, and some of them, of course, we're used to considering. So, for example, interpersonal power, the various ways people can hurt and abuse and neglect and reject and undermine each other. You know, trauma-informed practice is obviously very strong on that. Most therapists would be familiar with that. But we've also looked at forms of power which are perhaps less focused on. Things like, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but often not sufficiently addressed, economic and material power. Actually, have you got enough money to live on? Actually, are you living in decent housing? Actually, do you have you know, enough resources to meet your basic needs and the needs of your family? We tend, I think, to kind of assume that people who come into services may not have those assets, and that's just part of how it is, without really thinking about how that feeds into their distress. Mm -hmm. To give another example, we've looked at social and cultural capital. Now, very roughly speaking by that, we mean a kind of set of, um, you know, a combination of knowledge, experience and competence that helps you to find your way around the world, to 
make sure that you know you and your children let's say in your family have the best access to resources can you know make sure things work in a way that's useful to you you can stand up for yourself if you're badly treated you can find sources of help if you need support and so on mm-hmm. and again g- generally speaking people from all wealthy or privileged back or educated backgrounds have more of that and other people have less of it but if you assign someone a psychiatric diagnosis it's immediately a barrier to social and cultural capital you know mm-hmm. you'll find it harder to get a job you may be discredited when you complain and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. That's a form of power that is not often really considered. But, but perhaps the most important form of power that we think really needs to be on the map is ideological power. Mm-hmm. In other words, power over agendas and meanings. You know, the whole set of assumptions and norms that are often uncritically disseminated through the media and all the rest of it, but a form of which are disseminated through contact with the mental health services. So from the point of the framework biomedical model psychiatry is a prime example of the use of, imp- of ideological power because mm-hmm. it's a worldview that does not have, have any evidence to support it that never has had evidence to support it that clearly operates in the interests of people who are already quite powerful professionals drug companies and so on clearly overall operates to the disadvantage of people who are already less powerful as they probably wouldn't be in services in the first place and clearly operates by imposing a form of meaning on people, which goes along the lines of you have a mental illness of X, Y, or Z sort. If you start to challenge that, you will quickly find out that the power lies elsewhere. You're not allowed to challenge it. All sorts of consequences may follow from challenging it. So from the framework point of view, people who come into services are not only very likely already to be on the receiving end of all, all sorts of negative forms of power, they come in contact with an additional, very powerful ideological perspective which further disempowers them. And that goes right back to the whole thing about DSM and how valid it is and so on. But one of the key things about the framework is actually giving people the knowledge, the information to make up their own minds about how they want to describe their own experience. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really important form of restoring people's power, the ability to make their own meanings, ultimately to create new narratives that make more sense. Mm -hmm. If you look at the stories of many of the well-known survivors, as they would describe themselves, who've managed to leave psychiatry behind, you will often find there's a turning point in which they decided or someone helped them to decide or that they read a book that had opened their eyes to enable them to decide that I do not have to take on this meaning of my experiences anymore. I do not have to see myself as mentally ill. I do not have to see myself as having schizophrenia or whatever. And in many cases, that's enormously empowering and was actually the start of a journey towards recovery. Mm -hmm. Right. So unlike the DSM, the power threat meaning framework serves to not only acknowledge and recognize power as an influential force in the context of people's lives, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't impose an ideological form of power the way that diagnostic frameworks would. I hope it, you know, the intention is to open up narratives, not close them down. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, in what ways do you think that your personal beliefs and professional experience led you to participate in constructing the power threat meaning framework? Well, that's a good question, because I think for all of us, not just me, but the other people in the core group, uh, nine of us in the core group that put together the framework, it's not an accident. We end up in the situations we do and with the views we have. If I think about myself, I would certainly say it's not an accident. I went to, to mental health work and developed the views that I do have. You know, I'm an unremarkable person I come from an ordinary UK middle class background my parents are both school teachers Um, I have a brother and a sister I went to a decent school I mean in one sense nothing awful happened to me in another sense there were a number of ways and that I was always very unhappy as a child as a teenager as a young woman and I spent a lot of time thinking about that and you know it's clear to me that there were reasons for that and um, I'm afraid because of the person I was probably the world's most boring teenager I didn't deal with that by going out and doing anything interesting exciting like taking drugs or staying out all night or 
going to wild parties or anything, I dealt with it by reading. So at an unhealthily early age of about 12 or 13, I was already well stuck into reading psychology and psychotherapy books. And uh, by 15 or 16, I was thoroughly immersed in Jung and other readers that were very interesting and inspiring to me. And that was my way to try and make sense of it, if you like. And because of um, the, I come from a generation that was still quite influenced by the so-called anti-psychiatry movement. So when I started training as a psychologist, there were still people around, some of whom were very inspiring to me, who had worked with Lang, for example. Those ideas were still mm-hmm. around. So it all fitted for me, to be honest. So the personal thread of experiences that distress or madness has meaning, that very much chimed with some of the currents that were still around in the culture. And, you know, I've always believed that. I've always followed that thread through. I've always believed that madness has meaning. And for me, but also I think probably all of us in the project group would say the same thing. In a way, the framework is the culmination of a life experience, both personal and professional. And um, we all of us brought a range of experience to that task, which covered research, covered clinical practice, covered training, covered personal experience. And together, I think it made a rich mix whereby all of aspect, those aspects of our experiences were able to feed into the production of the document. Yeah, how did you go about constructing it? What was that intellectual process like? Well, it wasn't very planned, I have to say. <laughs> it kind of happened, uh, sort of accidentally. So, I mean, one sense the starting point is the position statement that the Division of Clinical Psychology issued in May 2013 at exactly the same time as DSM-5 was published and I was part of that position statement as were a couple of other people who were in the group and in essence it was a whole professional body calling for the end of the disease model of distress which is quite a brave and challenging thing to do Mm -hmm. and one of the recommendations was that if we're going to call for this then we need to be able to work out what an alternative would look like and join with survivors and other stakeholders to see what that might look like so it so happened that a group, which was virtually the project, core project team as it continued, happened to be meeting in the same place at the same time in t- November 2012. And we started a conversation about, well, what would this look like? And when we were still excitedly throwing ideas at each other about five hours later, we realised, well, we seem to be onto something here. And it kind of evolved from that without any plan, really. I mean, I was... I and Mary were the project leads. I've never been involved in anything as ambitious as that before. You know, I think it helped that the core group, we've all known each other for years, if not decades. So we knew, you know, we all knew where we were coming from. And I don't think any other group would have been able to take on such a task nearly so easily, I have to say. So there was a, a large degree of shared trust and friendship and shared ideas and understandings. And it, just kind of evolved from there really so we started to meet regularly we started to firm up some of our ideas we started to assign different aspects of the document to different people to take a lead on it we um, started to draw in other members and people to give advice and consultation we had set up a um, advisory group of service users and carers and uh About three years down the line, Mary and I realised that um, unless we devoted some really solid time for this, it was never going to happen. So we essentially spent two years, essentially unpaid in front of our computers, each of us, Mm. kind of pulling it together. And the Division of Clinical Psychology, which funded us, had to put it through their usual very thorough process of sending the drafts out for consultation and bringing the comments back. And we had to address the comments and then... We had to go through a process of checking that the comments had been sufficiently well dealt with and so on and so on. It's quite a long formal process. So that's how it happened. And it was very, very, very stressful at times, I can tell you. It's very stressful. (laughs) Because I think it's fair to say that for about two years, I think I felt, and I know Mary felt, and I think probably the others felt that were kind of, thinking, well, what the hell have we done here? It feels like we're wandering in kind of intellectual wilderness. 
and um, mm-hmm. firmly as we believed that the existing model is not fit for purpose, it's actually a much bigger task to put together something that is going to hold together as something different. Put your money where your mouth is mm-hmm. in the UK. So it was very stressful and difficult times, but you know we've emerged the other end and with an imperfect evolving document, but one I think that we overall feel very proud of. Well, I'd like to thank you. I'm sure many are grateful for the work that you've put into this. I, I remember you referring to it as the intellectual wilderness uh, previously when you had spoken to James, and it makes me think that by creating this, it's really challenging the heart of an institution, psychiatry, mm-hmm led by doctors, and I wonder how psychiatry has responded. And um, I'd like to get to the criticisms and the critiques that uh, you've received. But I think first, I want to ask what you believe the Power Threat Meaning Framework has accomplished, how you wish it to be used, and how would it change societal and professional thinking if it were to be adopted? Okay, so um, when we um, finally got this enormous project launched, I mean, I think it's fair to say we didn't exactly have ideas or plans as to how it could or should be used or what would happen next. Partly, to be honest, because we're exhausted. (laughs) (laughs) But partly because I guess our feeling, I mean, all of us are people who've spent a lot of time trying to kind of change systems which aren't going to change and bang our heads against brick walls and struggle in all sorts of ways that has been quite difficult. So I guess we wanted to move on to something where we felt we were going to push at open doors. And if people are interested, that's fine. And if they're not, that's equally fine. But actually, I think there comes, it's partly a kind of life stage thing, but there comes a point you think I've done enough of the kind of really hard trying to change things that aren't realistic going to change any further than they have. And I want to put my energies in towards something that feels more positive. And... Um, where I'm, we're essentially on the same side, pushing in the same direction. So we had no idea how it was going to develop, and I'm still, you know, it's still an evolving thing. You know, I don't know how it's going to, how far it's going to go. I don't know how what it's going to look like. I mean, if it was really fully implemented, then the landscape would look so different. I think it's actually quite hard to conceptualise because you've ended up with some really fundamental questions like, do we need a mental health system? Not all cultures and countries have had or do have a mental health system do we even need one that's a very big question and at a more immediate level then we quite deliberately haven't set out specific answers about well how might I work differently with this person or how might services look differently because we wanted this as I think I've said to be a conceptual resource a set of ideas which it's really up to people themselves to think about how they might put it into practice so we wanted to be, you know, be collaborating at all, you know, letting it go so other people can do what seems helpful because they will be the experts in their setting and their position. And the second stage of the project, if you like, is for that to happen as much as it happens. We hope to get feedback on that. We hope to learn from how people are using it, what's worked, what hasn't worked and so on. And I guess what we mainly wanted to accomplish is some sense of support for people who do want to think and do things differently and or see their lives differently and some ideas for them to put into practice to take them further down that road and that is how it seems to be working out so that's great and you know it's an ongoing journey so we'll see yeah it's different from these other frameworks in that it's not doesn't sound like it was meant to be standardized and sort of exported and i know that the movement for global mental health is increasingly the diagnostic model across the world. Uh, mm. What is the power threat meaning framework perspective on this? Well, that's an interesting question because I mean, one of the bigger scandals of our age, I think, is that not only is the diagnostic model comprehensively failing in the largely Western industrialized countries within which it was developed, it is at the same time, and this may not be a coincidence, being exported across the world. And this is generally seen to be a good thing. And I'm sure people are well motivated, well, most of them in doing it. Not quite sure about the drug companies, but, you know, I think we're too close to see what a scandal this is. I mean, it reminds me quite a lot of, you know, what you, 
100 years ago, 80 years ago, this might have, this would have been missionaries exporting Christianity. Do you know, they're all very well motivated, but actually this is in some senses similar, but I would say more damaging. And of course, it's a form of colonisation, I think, as some people have rightly, in my view, said, but it's a more insidious one because it's about taking over people's minds and actually persuading people this is what they want, these wonderful new Western scientific ways of you know, treating so-called illnesses. So one of the strong messages of the framework, we hope, is um, a message of respect for the many, many different culturally specific and culturally appropriate ways of understanding, expressing and healing distress across the globe. That's within the UK and within the USA and beyond. And, of course, this is very different from the DSM perspective because the DSM perspective has a great deal of trouble in trying to accommodate culturally specific expressions of distress because if these are medical illnesses, they all look roughly the same, wouldn't they? You know, diabetes or broken leg or malaria or whatever looks roughly the same wherever it happens. Expressions of distress can look extremely, extremely different. And of course, they can look extremely different you know, across time as well, historically. But in the power threat meaning framework terms, that absolutely makes sense because one of our core arguments is that instead of understanding distress through biological patterns, patterns that are borrowed from the kind of patterns that we see when things go wrong in our bodies, we need to understand distress through patterns that are organised by meaning they're organised by meaning, not by biology, which is a big conceptual leap and one of the fundamental conceptual leaps I think we made. Patterns of distress do form kind of, you know, they do have regularities, they do have something in common. We can draw on bigger patterns to explore and inform particular personal narratives. They don't come from nowhere. But we need to be thinking about how those patterns are based on, organised by social and cultural meanings, not by biology and something go, that's gone on with our bodies. So as soon as you get your head around that, you realise from a framework point of view, of course, expressions and experiences of distress are going to look very different cross-culturally because they're different cultures with different meanings and different norms and different assumptions. Mm-hmm. So that sets the scene for saying, well, fantastic, if that works, well, that's great. And actually to go further than that and say, there may be things we can learn from non-Western, non-industrialised cultures rather than the reverse, we're going to impose our model on you, so to speak. And I had a very valuable and privileged opportunity to test some of this out in a very small way recently because I was in New Zealand and Australia. And in New Zealand, um, I was able to run a two-day workshop where the first day was me presenting the framework the second day was um, some Maori speakers and attenders talking about their perspectives on distress which are you know extraordinarily different and completely new to me of course it's not my culture but are based on creation myths and understandings about Maori gods all that kind of thing and one of the more fascinating things to find out was that we were able to identify commonalities very different ways of, of looking at it, the framework is frame is looks is re- framed in very different terms from Maori curation stories. But at a very core level, there were commonalities. We all face the impact of power in our lives. We all experience threat. We all ascribe meaning to our experiences. We all respond in ways that could be described as threat responses. So if the framework is a default Western model, then I think it would lead to a very different strategy which would be about respecting and understanding and working alongside other cultural traditions not trying to kind of colonize and replace them and I would take it further than that actually because when I felt I learned a huge amount from this and another workshop we did in um, Australia which was you know without wanting to simplify or idealize it how much we in the west have lost in terms of understandings about what human beings need you know how much we have typically lost in terms of ordinary human connection with each other in terms of a sense of identity that comes from being part of a group or a tribe or identifying with a part of the land or the country that you come from how much we've learned in terms of 
what could be called spiritual values and meanings. Now, all of those messages, I think, need to be fed back into the framework so that it can develop further in those ways, which are mentioned but not expanded on. Mm -hmm. So that was a really rich conversation. And, um, you know, I look forward to having more conversations of the same kind. Yeah, absolutely. That point that by understanding our distress as biochemical or genetic abnormalities, that we're stripping ourselves of all this other possible meaning and understanding ourselves and all these other facets spiritually and contextually. Indeed. And I think that does, as I was saying, challenge psychiatry. And I wonder how psychiatry has responded and what the criticisms have been. Okay, so psychiatry as a profession, well, psychiatrists vary, as you know. Sure. It's been kind of interesting um, because there is a group of psychiatrists in the UK, as you may know, called the Critical Psychiatry Network, who are very outspoken critics of a lot of the way psychiatry works. And I've spoken at, I was invited to speak at their annual conference this year. They were very supportive, very interested, very welcoming. So their work is cited and quoted in the framework. So we see many of those people as saying very similar things and you know, as being allies and supporters. Other psychiatrists, of course, have viewed it rather differently <laughs> and, as expected, have, well, I, I like to think that the usual line of defence is goes kind of ignore, attack, assimilate. So any, any, any approach that challenges the status quo, you tend to see ignore, let's pretend no one ever said this, attack, let's say this apart, assimilate in some ways the most dangerous stage I think because it's like we'll take on bits and pieces of this but we'll ignore the fundamental message and the whole roadshow will continue much as before so we'll have psychiatrists before but we'll have a hearing voices group for half an hour once a week on the ward where we give people a few coping strategies and yeah otherwise everything will go on as before although interestingly we seem to have gone straight to the attack phase with the framework so I don't know what that means but I do want to say that it's really, really, really much bigger than, as it's sometimes unhelpfully phrased, psychiatry versus psychology. Do you know what I mean? This is about a way of thinking, as we've already said, it's about a way of thinking that's deeply embedded in all of our minds, in the, or every professional of any background you come across, in many members of my own profession, psychologists, who have much less excuse, to be honest, and uh, many of them are quite as outspoken critics as some psychiatrists. So that that's that's been the response, and um, you know some of the thing, things people say are, well, you know I think it's important to listen every to everything that comes back at you, but some of it strikes me as quite odd. For example, I mean one of the big criticisms we've got is that um, your framework isn't evidenced. Well, the diagnostic model isn't evidenced, that's for sure, mm. and. Uh, we have actually got 70 pages of references and a massive overview of the evidence. Now, of course, the, the particular way we've assembled the evidence in the framework has not itself been evaluated yet, but that's what, you know, how could it be evaluated in, the, in advance of writing it? Do you know what I mean? We, mm -hmm. It's there. Part of the next stage is for people to try it out, is for people to evaluate it, is for people to feedback. And some of the less constructive criticisms have been, of course, saying you're anti-psychiatry, which in the UK is a kind of all-purpose way of dismissing you. And uh, we're Scientologists. Of course we're Scientologists. What other possible reason could we have? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the system isn't going to change easily. And by the system, I mean all the professionals who are involved in it. But as I said, that's not mainly where we're aiming. I think the time has come to kind of you know, as much as we can step aside from all that stuff and promote good practice and different practice where we can and where there are people willing to listen and try out new things. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like it's in the attack phase. Have you seen assimilations happening, even if they are the 30-minute, you know, um, built in to... I, I have seen some assimilations happen, mm -hmm. yes, I have. And I've seen people saying things like, oh, well, this could be really useful to kind of, you know, enhance our formulations. Well, yes, but it's just a little bit more ambitious than that. It's not about the formulations. I mean, it might be, but, you know, if, if that's the only bit of it you're going to take, you're going to have missed 98% of the point. I know that there has been critique about service user and survivor involvement in the Power Threat Meaning Framework project. Can you discuss those critiques that you've received as, as well as your responses to them? I will do, yes. So 
we've generally had very positive responses from service users, survivors, peer groups. So there's a number of peer groups in the UK, in now in New Zealand and Australia who have taken on the framework and have used it with the people they're supporting and have used it in their groups and so on, which is great. There's one peer group that even, has even taken on training other peer groups, you know, completely without professional input. I mean, that's fantastic. That's what we wanted to happen. This, you know, take it and run with it. Mm. And we've had some really, really heartwarming feedback from particular people who said, you know, I see my difficulties in a very different way. I don't feel I have to feel so different or guilty or ashamed and so on. And we've had some, you know, very fair criticism, particularly that it's not very easy to read in most of its current form. I think that's fair. I think we want to think about more accessible forms and we are doing that and of course there are people who say well it doesn't really seem to fit or describe me that's absolutely fine and of course there are people who are happy with the diagnostic model and feel that does fit and suit them and that's absolutely fine too because we it is really not our aim or nor is it within our power to go imposing this framework on people Mm -hmm. you know that's it's a people to pick up if they want We've had some criticisms, quite angry criticisms, that I think are based on misunderstandings. And I can't blame anyone for not reading through the whole document. It is long, but (laughs) the risk is you pick up ideas that aren't actually what we said. Hmm. So one of the regular comments we get is, well, I need my diagnosis for welfare and service access so you're going to take away my diagnosis also the system's going to leap on this and say aha these people aren't ill so we don't need to give them support and so on and actually we've very clearly said at a number of points in the document the first priority must be to protect people's access to benefits and services of course it must be and this is a discussion document it's not a plan for services or for benefit offices or for the you know, it's a way of discussing ideas. But, I mean, I would still maintain that the, the current benefit system is not working. You know, and the same people who are understandably anxious about will this make life even more difficulty, I think, would be the first to admit that, I mean, the system is appalling in the UK, not just in the UK. You know, people ask, diagnosis is very often used to exclude as well as include people. And most people are really struggling and they have to go through a humiliating process of describing themselves on their worst day and accepting a label that they may not be happy with in order to have the bare minimum to live on. This system really, really does need changing. Of course, it needs changing in a way that doesn't put people more at risk. But I think we have to have these discussions. And there have been other people who I think have understood it or misunderstood it as saying we're going to go around the country tearing people's diagnoses off people and saying you're not allowed to use this language. And again, we've clearly said people have to have the right to describe their experiences in the way that makes most sense to them. But people are very, very rarely offered that choice. They very rarely offer that choice. And I think I want to say a little bit more about that because there's another aspect on this which is a little bit difficult to talk about. But, I mean, there has been way before the framework was published, way before anyone had read a word in it, way before anyone knew who was involved in it and who wasn't involved in it and how the service user consultation happened, there has been a very deliberate campaign from an alliance of kind of some survivors or some professionals to trash it. And we were warned about this, you know, several times by several people, but we knew this was coming anyway. Mm. And there are complicated reasons for that. You know, survivor politics is complicated in the UK. I'm sure it is in the US. Uh, Professional politics feeds into that. So this is a group of people who I think have unfortunately to some extent successfully managed to spread the kind of what you might call in the US fake news oh. <laughs> that all these evil things happened or didn't happen, that people were excluded or silenced or, you know, I mean, some really quite extreme claims were made. But I would very strongly defend the way that we produce the document and that it is a co-produced, as we would say, in the UK document. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not a perfect process. No process is perfect. But it was co-produced with survivor members at the core of the basic team from the very first meeting. We also had a survivor carer group. 
our survivors were absolutely given equal status and pay. We absolutely could not have done it without them. It's hard to think of any other project of this nature and ambition that could make that same claim, I think. I mean, the nearest thing, perhaps, is the Hearing Voices movement, which, of course, is very much survivor-led. But, I mean, I find it hard to think of another parallel. So Mm -hmm. I would very much defend this as a co-produced document. And I think it's also important to point out that this is not a plan for services. This is not a plan for anything else. It is a set of ideas. Now, at any point at which it starts to become a plan for a particular service or setting, then we would expect and hope that survivors would be thoroughly involved in are we going to implement this and what it's going to look like. At that stage, you would certainly want very full consultation. But that is the next stage down the road. We have set out some ideas to discuss and we've done it in a way that, you know, I I feel proud of the extent to which there's been a joint production between professionals and some others. I also know that people have expressed concern about the framework's association with the British Psychological Society. How would you respond to those who are wary of BPS as a professional body with relative power in the field? Uh, That's an interesting question. And in fact, the part of the process I missed out is that when we first started meeting, we actually thought we'd do this on our own. Partly for those reasons, we didn't want it branded as a psychology project as such. And we didn't want to be restricted in what we were going to say. But in fact, it proved impossible. We did need at least a bit of money simply to meet travel expenses, to have our research assistant, Kate Alltop, support us, to pay the survivors who inputted. Sure. And we got that money from a small grant from the Division of Clinical Psychology. And I would think if this was an official Division of Clinical Psychology or British Psychological Society report or statement, then I think that criticism would have a lot more force because you would be saying, well, what's their interest in promoting this as something psychologists have to do or whatever? It's not. It's a discussion document, as I said. It's Mm. not official policy. And the way it's worked out is that I think we found both the DCP and the BPS enormously supportive. So they funded, you know, very generously a big launch with 400 free places. So it's accessible as possible. They've given out nearly 3,000 free copies of the framework to anyone who emails in. You don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to be a professional of any sort. All resources are free and will continue to be free. So... I would hope this is an example of power used benevolently. And at the same time, of course, we all need to be aware of, you know, the sources of information, don't we? That is a moral of the framework. Who funds it? Who supports it? Whose logos on it? We have to be aware of those things. In this respect, I think the involvement of the DCP and BPS has been not only essential, but overall very helpful. Mm. But the project wouldn't exist in its current form had they not been part of supporting it. And you mentioned that there are a number of resources that are free and accessible to anyone, uh, which makes me curious, once the framework was published, how have you gone about promoting the Power Threat Meaning Framework and how has that gone? Well, as I said earlier, there's been no plan. (laughs) (laughs) I seem to have accidentally got a full diary for the rest of my life now. (laughs) Like I said, we wanted to kind of follow people's lead in a way. And uh, that's in keeping with the spirit of it, really. It's not about imposing something, it's about offering it and mm-hmm. supporting people to think it, think it through further. I mean, I'm the person, I've because I've given up my job to um, do the framework, and I'm the person with the most time, so it's been mainly me. But other members of the project, I don't want to kind of make it, I don't want it to look like it's just, you know, my project, it really, really isn't. It, and I'm presenting the work that we've all done together. So my recent, the recent draw of Australia, John Crombie came out with me for a few weeks and that was great. We did our, the workshops together. We've just kind of gone with the flow, really, and it's led to invitations from not just New Zealand and Australia, but from Spain and Ireland and Denmark and various other places coming up. It's now appearing in several textbooks. It's been taken on, you know, in some small scale mainly ways but increasingly bigger scale ways across services and in some voluntary organizations and in some peer groups as I mentioned there's a Spanish translation there are other translations in the pipeline so it is happening it seems to be developing a momentum of its own although it's not a momentum that in any way has been planned by us. Mm -hmm. No it's certainly getting attention 
uh, across the globe. And I wonder where do we go from here if it's the world of psychiatry still seems to be mostly governed by the DSM. You were speaking to this earlier about what the change process is and does it feel like a lost cause if that's the case? It doesn't feel like a lost cause because my view is that we are actually witnessing the crumbling of an entire paradigm that with or without the framework, the days of the diagnostic paradigm are numbered. And if you get that stuff, you know, the Thomas Kuhn stuff, structure of scientific revolutions, we're seeing all the sign of the crumbling of a paradigm. That We're seeing massive contradictions within the paradigm. We're seeing desperate attempts to shore it up. You know, we're seeing a mountain of evidence that it's not correct and that other ways are better way forward. And one of the things that Thomas Kuhn says is that all these things can happen and yet the paradigm won't fundamentally shift unless or until there is somewhere else to jump to, if you like. Mm. Well, I I think there are actually a number of places to jump to. And I think the the trauma-informed perspective, which we've drawn on to quite a large extent in the framework, is one of them. But I think the framework itself, I hope, can also be seen as additional support for that kind of approach and as a, you know, a place to jump to in itself. So if it becomes a small part of that inevitable process, and I do think it's inevitable, then we will be pleased and proud. And I don't think I'm going to be around to see the final stages of this drama, but it's very exciting. (laughs) It's very exciting to be part of it. And all the signs are that the framework is at the very least giving people the confidence that perhaps it's not so weird or strange or bizarre or unevidenced or, you know, unprofessional or whatever, however else you might put it, to start to think very differently and think in non-diagnostic ways. So even if it never went any further than it has at the moment, I think we'd still feel we had achieved more than we hoped for, actually, and been part of a bigger process of change. Well, that's very heartening to hear. I think as we reflect now together on the responses to the Power Threat Meaning Framework, we've covered a lot. Is there anything else that you'd like to touch upon? I don't think so. I'd encourage people to read the links you're going to put at the bottom to see, to find out more. Make of it what you will. It's over to you to read, not read, watch videos, don't watch videos, agree, disagree, agree with some of it disagree with some of it and see if there's any bits of it that you think might be useful. That seems to be a fitting conclusion at this idea of not wanting to impose any sort of power, um, but allowing people to come up with that meaning for distress or for whatever it is and their own expression for experiences. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.